As a little boy, Easter was always a big deal in my house. You didn't have to find your Easter basket. It was just there. Anybody have to find their Easter basket? Was it hidden? A bunch of Easter eggs. A couple weeks later, still unfound. A month later, really stinks. I have great memories of Easter, but, you know, as a kid, I just uh, loved waking up in the morning and thinking that I have this huge Easter basket full of candy, which I'm probably going to eat in one day. A great meal, family coming over, you know, the, the only problem with Easter was having to go to Mass. I mean, I like the candy, I like the, the eggs, I like the breakfast, I like the family, didn't care much for the church, didn't really understand the concept, I guess. I don't know if you feel like that today, or maybe there's more exciting things going on in your life than church, but you know, there's no place I'd rather be on Easter morning than with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because the Lord is here. This is the Lord's house. And um, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And He is here. And I am so thankful that I have changed from a little boy that only concerned himself with what kind of Easter uh, he might receive on Easter morning in a basket to the risen Savior who's changed my life and continues to amaze me each and every day because he gives me what I don't deserve. Liberty and freedom, grace and forgiveness. So this is my third time preaching this message. Now the first time I did so, it was outside. My notes were blowing, but it went really, really well. The second time I preached, it was at the 9 o'clock service this morning. Yeah. I, I don't know what it is at the 9 o'clock. There's something about the 9 o'clock service. It, there's fewer people. I'll, I'll be the first to tell you that. Brian, you weren't here, okay? You weren't here. And you come to the 11, and I knew we'd have more people at the 11. There's always a little bit more energy at the 11. So give yourselves a round of applause for being at the 11 and not the 9 o'clock service. Like you just accomplished something. I don't know. Anyway, empty tomb, full life. I've got 30 minutes with you this morning, and I am so excited to preach this message. I love preaching on Easter. I love it. I love singing on Easter. And I thought our praise and worship team did a wonderful job. Didn't they sound wonderful in the choir and everyone? And Mandy and everybody worked so hard for us. Here we go. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, placed it in his own tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priest and the Pharisees, they went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he had been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal. Everyone say seal. They put a seal on the stone and posted the guard. 
Now you need to understand that seeing at the tomb is important. It's very important that you understand that this is a big stone. This is not a small stone. It can't be easily moved. And you said yourself they put a seal on it. So I'm going to be sharing God's Word with you in two different parts today. The first part we've already read. Then I'm going to be going over some points in my message this morning. And then I'm going to be closing with the second piece of Scripture. So it's a little bit different today. So four lessons that we learn from the tomb. Number one, be realistic. The Christian life can be an emotional roller coaster. Imagine with me for a moment this morning the disillusionment, the disappointment of the disciples that are waiting for Jesus to be their king. Not crucified. There's a reason why they scattered, my friends. He told them on the third day he will rise again. Not even them, but even the religious leaders knew that he would rise again on the third day. That's why they said to Pilate that this tomb needs to be secured. It needs to be guarded because if it's not, this deceiver, his body will be taken and it'll be worse at the end than it was at the beginning. And boy, did they know. Boy, did they know that it would be. But in the Christian life, I want you to be realistic, my friends, that the Christian life is a roller coaster ride. There are ups and there are downs. And life is full of disappointment. Just because God has saved you and sanctified you, just because the Lord is working in your life, just because He has saved you, He loves you, He has redeemed you, does not mean you are on easy street. Pastor, I already know that. I had a best friend actually in high school. He lived on easy street. But nobody lives on easy street. But I'm thinking of the disciples. Disappointed. Locked up, hidden, scared, afraid. I mean, these are the ones that cast out demons. These are the ones that walked with Jesus. They were notorious. People would come up to them, just let us have a moment with the Messiah. Let us have a moment with Jesus. Now they find themselves behind closed doors. Point number two, be patient. Desperate circumstances sometimes can be quickly reversed. Must have been a long three days for the disciples. The remaining disciples hid behind a locked door, paralyzed by fear, stricken by fear, shock of what was happening to their Lord, their Savior their friend, their God. My friends, I want to remind you that there are times in your life in which there is nowhere to turn. You can't go to the left and you can't go to the right and you can't go forward and you can't go backwards. You might as well look up to know where your help comes from because there's nowhere else for you to go. Maybe you're at the end of your rope and you realize that everything that you have done has been for nothing. All the energy, all the time, all the pursuits in your life, all the times that you thought it was going to work out, you were just going to hit it big time. And you never did. It's like going to 7-Eleven for a scratch off. That's how life is. You go to 7-Eleven for a scratch-off? I'm not encouraging you to do that. But if you do, you're not going to win. I know you read stories about people who win, but you're not going to win. And you are not going to win in life if you view life as a scratch-off, my friends, because you have no control over the things that happen in your life. 
Well, pastor, if I try this route, if I try that route, I've not tried this one yet. Maybe we need to stop looking at our own wisdom, our own devices, our own understanding, and look up and realize that God has a better plan for us, but we need to be patient, my friends. Desperate circumstances can be quickly reversed because God has a better plan for your life, and it's not a scratch-off ticket. Number three, be faithful even when God doesn't change your circumstances. Oh, how quickly we turn to the left or the right. Pastor, you don't know how many times I prayed. God hasn't answered my prayer. Pastor, you don't know how long I've waited. Really? Did you wait longer than Abraham? Come on. Did you wait longer than Moses? Did you wait longer than the disciples? Tell me how long you've waited, my friends. Tell me how impulsive you are. Because your God is not impulsive. Your God is a patient God. Your God is a merciful God. And I am thankful for that because I wouldn't be here if he wasn't. And neither would most of you. Be faithful even when God doesn't change your circumstances. The disciples remained together praying, talking, and encouraging each other even in the midst of their fear and disillusionment. I have to be the first to tell you that, you know, life is tough, but God is good. God's plan is better than your plan. Number four, God's plan is supreme. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, not to harm you, but plans to give you hope in a future. Jeremiah 29, 11. So God has a plan for you. And at Park Place Church, we want people to understand that God has a divine plan for their life. It probably has nothing to do with what you can fathom. Nothing to do with what you're thinking. God has a purpose for you, my friends. And it's for His kingdom. Amen. It's for His glory. It's not for your enrichment. It's not always for your pleasure. It's not always for your instant gratification. But we have become a society that wants it now. We don't like to wait for things. I was 15 when my father told me that he had some money set aside for me. And that he and I were going to find an old Mustang somewhere and we were going to rebuild it together. And we found a 73 Fastback Mustang. No engine, no transmission. Both quarter panels were dented in. And the back had been hit, which caused the dents in the rear quarters. Long story short, we pulled the car home and spent two years rebuilding this car together. Time well spent with my father. I'll never forget hearing that car start up for the very first time after we dropped the, the engine in it. Now, we made lots of mistakes along the way. Naturally, I told him I wanted a 429 Cobra jet, <laughs> which we found. I cleaned up, you know, gunked it up, you know, used gunk on it, degreased it, the whole nine, sprayed her down, put her in. The shock towers were in the wrong place. The motor mounts were fine. It was the shock towers that created the problem. You see, it needed a 351 Cleveland or a 302. That set us back about six months. Pull it out. Found a 302. Cleaned it up. Painted it blue. That's what you do with Fords. Drop it back in. I was a senior before I got that car on the road. You should have seen the cars I drove before I finally got my Mustang on the road. My friends, do we go through Christian life 
like 16-year-old impulsive teenagers? Perhaps we want it now. My dad was not going to find me a car for twelve or $14,000. He was going to find me a car for $700 in the middle of a field in North Branch, Michigan that we could work on together. And we have to remember that sometimes it's better to wait, my friends, because the purpose of waiting has rewards. It's better to wait. It's better to dream. God's plan for your life is better than yours, my friends. He said, what color are you going to paint it or have it painted? Now, he paid half of the price, and I paid the other half of the price. So we split it 50-50, even though it was my car. First, I said, we're going to paint it yellow. Then I said, we're going to paint it red. Then I said, we're going to paint it grabber green, which is a popular Ford color. Then I said, we're going to paint it white with black Mach 1 stripes down the side with the Ram Air hood. And finally, he just said, I'm just, just forget it, just paint it yellow. We'll do, we'll do the black stripes, just paint it yellow. That was your first choice. I, I couldn't make up my mind. And we finished it, and it was beautiful. And I have the same year car today. And when I get in it and I smell the vinyl and the exhaust, it always reminds me of my father and the time and the labor arguments that we put in over this car. Three transmissions two engines. But my father seemed to have a better plan than me. Even though not everything he did was right, we didn't make every good decision, but we made them together. But see, some people go through life on their own because they think they know what's best for them. They think they know what's best for their future. But I'm finding the disciples did not know what was best because they wanted a political king. Remember, it was James and John's mom who said, let my sons be at your left and your right when you enter your kingdom. She was not talking about a heavenly kingdom, my friends. She was talking about a political structure in which they would be given places of honor. Matthew 28 says, After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were like snow. Some of you are going to have to Google what snow looks like when you get home because you've never seen it here in Florida. <laughs> Growing up in Michigan, we had such large amounts of snow and they would plow the streets and they would put all this snow in one place that they would make mounds of snow that it was probably 15 or 18 feet high. So we as little kids would go in and make tunnels through this. And had so much fun with snow. Can you imagine the garments that the angel was wearing? Well, let me remind you. Let me remind you. If we look at the beginning of this, it talks about an earthquake. Tombs opened. Guards were fearful. People witnessed the resurrection of the saints and the resurrected Jesus. And they went to the holy city. Not just did Jesus raise from the grave, my friends, but the people rose from the grave. Jesus set the captives free for three days. He was in the core of the earth, preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn on the first day of the week, it says, the resurrection takes place. 
Not on the Sabbath, which is the seventh day of the week, but on a weekday, the first day at creation, God sanctified the Sabbath. But the last day of the week at the resurrection, Jesus sanctifies the first day. Behold, there was an earthquake. I found it interesting that it wasn't the first earthquake because when Jesus was on the cross, there was an earthquake. And now there's an earthquake again? Remember when he was on the cross, the ground shook, the temple tore in two. And now there's an earthquake again if we read this scripture. The angel was dazzling and rolled away the stone, telling us that God is ushering a new age. They reminded us of Israel's encounter of God on the mountain with Moses. The angel's appearance is reminiscent of the ancient of days in Daniel chapter 7 and 10. And the angel rolled away the stone and he sat on it. The stone at the tomb of Jesus was a pebble to the rock of ages that was inside. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. I like that. The angel's appearance makes it clear that the angel is no ordinary being. This is no ordinary moment in history. Jesus has risen to inaugurate a new era in salvation. The angel's appearance is reminiscent of Moses' shining face after his encounter with God and Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. The angel's appearance both reflects God's glory and authenticates the angel's heavenly origins. You cannot be in the presence of God without glowing, my friends. Oh, and I've seen some glow. Come on. I have seen some glow. I have not seen an angel like the Bible is describing today, but I have seen people that have spent time with Jesus, and they got Jesus all over them. You can just sense Jesus on them. They have an anointing on them, my friends. The Bible says the guards were so afraid of him, that is the angel, that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. This is my favorite part. This is my favorite part of the scripture, and I really look forward to sharing this piece with you because the guards shook like dead men. I like that. I like that. Doesn't say the women do. The guards. They're scared to death. The earth quakes, and the guards quake too. Jesus, who is supposed to be dead, is alive. And the guards who are supposed to be alive become like dead men. Is that our God? Think about that for a moment. The irony of that, my friends. Jesus is supposed to be dead and he is alive and the soldier is supposed to be alive, but he is dead. They were prepared for Jesus' Jesus' disciples. They were prepared. The guard, he was prepared for women. He was not prepared for an angel. The only reason why he was shaking like a dead man, which, by the way, dead men don't shake, by the way, but just in case you didn't know that. He was fearful because of the angel, not because of the women. He was fearful not because Jesus was alive, but because of the angel. He was fearful for what he saw. 
He was fearful for what he was experiencing. But the angel answered the women, not the guard. Let him quake. Let him be afraid. I did not come for him. I've come for you. He can guard the tomb. I will guard you because you love Jesus. The angel answered the women, do not be afraid. I don't care about him, but do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. There it is. It's on the screen. It is difficult for faith to dwell with fear. Perfect love cast away all fear. And the angel comes to restore their faith. What does the Bible say about that? Don't be afraid. These are the words that the angel spoke to Joseph concerning his pregnant fiance. Jesus taught, therefore, don't be afraid. You are more valuable than many sparrows. When he came across the stormy sea to the disciples, he said, it is I. Do not be afraid. At the transfiguration, Jesus reassured the disciples, get up. Don't be afraid. Now the angel says to the women, do not be afraid. It is a gracious moment in which God's messenger acknowledges the women's natural fear and helps them past it. Just like the Lord helps you with your natural fear of your upcoming surgery, your natural fear of losing your parents, your natural fear of running out of money before you retire, Or your irrational fear of snakes. Or maybe I'm just speaking about myself. But the angel says to the women, do not be afraid. And the angel rolls back the stone. But not to let Jesus out. But to let the women in. You see, Jesus isn't coming out. Not one amen. Jesus isn't coming out of the tomb, my friends, because he's risen. He is risen indeed. He isn't coming out of the tomb. The stone is rolled so the women can come in. Take a look, he says, to where he laid. He didn't decay here. He didn't lay here for very long. This is where they put him. You can come in and take a look real quick. There is no stench in this place because he didn't die here. He didn't decay here. He has risen. And so the stone was rolled away so the women could come in, but Jesus did not come out. Lazarus came out. Jesus did not come out. He is not here for he has risen just like he said. The good news is not just that Jesus' spirit lives, but that he has been raised bodily to new life. Come see the place where the Lord was lying. Come see the place where they laid him temporarily, left him. Come see the place where they left him before he departed. The angel invites the women to see the empty tomb. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away to the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples, Go quickly. He has risen from the dead. So the angel commissions the women as the first missionaries to proclaim the good news of the resurrection of Christ. Behold, he goes before you in Galilee. This is old news, my friends. This may be good news, but it's not new news. This is old news. Jesus already told them. There you will see him. The promise is that these disciples will see not just the open tomb, but the risen Christ. 
The women departed quickly from the tomb with fear and joy and ran to bring the disciples word of what they had experienced. I love that. They were obedient. Suddenly Jesus met them and he said to them, greetings. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. This is the second time they've had to been told not to be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Wait a minute. Hold the phone. I must have the wrong notes. I must have made a mistake somewhere. Maybe it's a, maybe, maybe it's a weird translation this morning. Maybe, maybe I got into some paraphrase I shouldn't have got myself into. Jesus calls them servants. He says, I no longer call you servants then. He says, now I call you friends because a friend knows his master's business. But I'm not reading that this morning. He calls them my brothers. He calls them my sisters. Something changed. You see, the resurrection changes everything, my friends. Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go into Galilee, and there they will see me there. Jesus says, rejoice. And they came, and they took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him. And he said, don't be afraid. The angel told you, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers that they should go to Galilee. You see, brother to brother is a more intimate relationship than disciple to master. Another gracious moment. Jesus promises to confess before the Father. Anyone who confesses Jesus before the people. But he warned that he will deny anyone who denies him. The disciples have deserted Jesus, and Peter had already denied him three times. But justice demands that Jesus reciprocate. That's justice. Justice demands that Jesus reciprocate. I will treat you the way you treat me, but love demands that he forgive. We've already established the fact that Jesus is love. So he forgives. So the 11 disciples go to Galilee. And therefore they hear Jesus say, go and make disciples of all nations. This isn't the first time that Jesus includes Gentiles in his ministry. The Magi introduced Gentiles at the story's beginning. Jesus healed a centurion servant and a Canaanite woman's daughter Now the Great Commission formalizes ministry to those outside of the Jewish nation. And we are left wondering, what does that mean for me? Pastor, I understand your passion for this story. I understand your excitement. Pastor, I understand the events that you've outlined for me in Scripture. But what does it mean for me? My friends... He is not on the cross. He has risen. He said, if I be lifted up, I draw all men to myself. That if I be lifted up, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may be with me. I go to prepare a place for you. I believe is he's preparing a place for me now in which our bodies will be glorified and we will have a family reunion like we've never experienced a family reunion before. If we're ready, if we've been forgiven, if our lives have been changed, if we know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, We have confessed our sins. We have not only confessed our sins, but we have believed in our heart of hearts that God raised him from the dead. Then we will be saved, my friends. Would you stand with me? As we close our time together with prayer,
Yes, the tomb is empty. And no, Jesus did not have to walk out because he was raised to life. My Jesus flew out of there. That's how awesome my Jesus is. Have you put your faith in this Jesus? Have you asked him to forgive you, knowing that you were born a sinner? Have you asked him to come into your life and change you, that you will never be the same again? Are you born again, my friends? Lest a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. Oh, let us hold back nothing. No sin, no habit, no secrets. Let us give everything to God this morning. This is the gospel presentation. And it always ends with a prayer. And the Bible says that if you say Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, my friends. It's not just saying it, it's believing it. We sometimes get that mixed up. Just repeating a prayer with me is a work, my friend, and works can't save you. None of you are good enough to be saved by works. Even those of you that are the most moral, you've got to say the words and believe them in your heart. This is the gospel. And you can't be found unless you know you're lost. And this man, I for one, know what it's like to be lost. Would you bow your heads? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you that the grave that held Jesus couldn't keep him. They laid him and he rose from the grave. And you resurrected him, Father, and I thank you for that. He paid my debt. He was punished for my transgressions, God, and there are many. And Father, he took away all the sins of the world. And I profess that he is my Lord and my Savior, my sweet Jesus. I'm thankful he didn't have to walk out of the tomb like Lazarus, but he rose to life. Father, if there's anyone here this morning that has never been saved, they've never been born again, the Holy Spirit is a foreign agent to them. They are unaware of the way he works and the way he moves. Father, I pray they would confess their sins to you now that they would declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, Jesus is King, Jesus is God. They will put their faith in Him and in Christ alone. For our, our lives will never be the same, Lord. All things will pass away and all things will become new. We thank You for this day, Resurrection Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Give the Lord a round of applause. God did it. God did it. God is good and worthy of our praise. Got a couple quick announcements for you just before you go. Many of you understand and remember the passing of our dear sister, Rita Morissette. She's been a part of the church for... Uh, maybe 25, 30 years. Um, she's been here for a long time. We'll be celebrating her life April 10th. It should be on the screen there, 10 a.m. here at Park Place Church. Please come if you're able. Also, uh, we have Blossom the Cross. I want to thank everyone for bringing flowers and making it look beautiful. Um, we do ask you, if you want to take pictures, to bring your family up. Just kind of social distance as much as you can. Take some pictures, and uh, happy Easter. I understand, I understand a lot of you are having um, ham. I've heard pork roast. Um, anyone else having veggie burgers, or is it just me? One, Nikki? Nikki and I, okay, there's a couple in the back maybe. All right. The impossible meat. That's what they call it. Anyway, I don't have anything else to say. <laughs> Enjoy your pork roast. Let me pray over you guys. Father, thank you for this wonderful crowd today. Thank you for the time of celebrating. 
the resurrection. You are a good God. And we are amazed. We are in awe of the things you can do in our lives. Help each and every one of us find and fulfill God's purpose for living. That we wouldn't fall short. That we wouldn't be selfish. That today we would celebrate our risen Savior and enjoy our families. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. 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 You are dismissed, my friends.